Good morning and welcome to you all that have joined this morning uh, for our interesting webinar on Digital Twin, Holy Grail or Holy Hype, a provocatively titled subject that hopefully will go some way to answer as we go through the, 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 uh, the following session. Um, my name is Bradley Obiggs. I am CEO and Professor of Practice at the um, Institute of Digital Engineering. We are um, uh, also lead the spoke, the digital spoke for the Advanced Propulsion Center. And today's event is an adva Advanced Propulsion Center, um, the first actually in a series of webinars led by the Advanced Propulsion Center called The Road to COP26. And it's our privilege to lead off that series with this subject today. Um, we're joined by a number of fantastic panelists representing a, a different range of sectors where we'll have a bit of a debate hopefully later around the subject as in holy grail or holy hype. Um, and you'll see some great examples of digital twins and how they're being used today. So firstly, a, a few housekeeping notes, uh, which you've probably become quite accustomed to now over the last 18 months. Uh, firstly, you will have the opportunity of asking questions um, predominantly in the panel session towards the end. So please do think about questions as we present the material to you. We're also going to be brave, um, as we've been used to doing, where if you want to come live and ask the question audio only, then we'll invite you to do so. But please put your questions in the Q&A um, tab at the bottom. Um, we'll review the questions and then um, converse with you over the chat to see whether you're happy to come live and ask your question of the panelists. Um, recording. The webinar will be recorded. It'll be published on the APC website and the IDE uh, website as well. Um, chat, please feel free. It's, it's quite a controversial subject. Um, and so please feel free to chat either with the panelists or amongst yourselves in the chat function. And also we'll have members of the IDE team there to maybe answer some broader questions if you're interested. And feedback at the end, we'll have a short survey just to capture your views on the event, uh, the material presented, and anything we can do better in the future. So, Digital Twin, um, we, the IDE, published on behalf of the Automotive Council and APC in March, a quite a comprehensive digitalization roadmap where we took nine months engaging with some of the best minds across both the automotive sector, but importantly, many other sectors, um, to try and map out over the next 20 years where we in the UK need to develop this new capability using new science and technology if we're going to make, remain competitive and relevant in, in, in the UK. So we created four buckets, essentially. One was digital engineering environment, one was process and assurance, one was co-creative ecosystem. And very importantly, we were one of the first, in fact, the only second of the Auto Council roadmap that actually addressed this issue about people and culture, which again, we'll talk about a little bit later, we see as fundamental to the, the, the revolution that we're looking for in, in this new methods of delivering or creating next generation complex product. We're not going to cover the whole roadmap today, that's not the purpose, but where we're going to zoom in on is this subject of digital twin, which again is on the roadmap, it's highlighted on the screen now. And in the nine months of work, it, was, it became relatively clear with all the stakeholders we were talking with the digital twin could be positioned as the most advanced manifestation of a digital engineering environment. That doesn't mean to say you have to start in that advanced state, but if done correctly, if using all the latest tools at our disposal that are now being generated, the digital twin could be the most advanced form of, of engineering environment. And you can see at the top, at the, at, at, at also absolutely critical as a foundation is data moving down through the, the different subjects there through into operability through to through to digital twin so that's why we see we're almost starting at the end but it's a really really important topic that's become um, um much talked about at the moment in the media in the press by organizations so what so today we're trying to shine a little bit of light on what is a digital twin um and does it add value to an organization or is it just the latest buzzword that everybody's going to run around trying to deliver um, without maybe um, fully understanding the impact on an organization? So we'll get into that in a bit more detail later. There are many definitions of digital twin as well. It's a bit like the Tower of Babel in the, in the digital twin spaces as well. Um, so lots of definitions are starting to crop out and they all come at it from a slightly different lens naturally. And we're not suggesting that there needs to be one definition, but what we did do within the automotive sector um, with a, a selection of um, leading academic institutions with engagement from a number of um, different industrial 
companies, um, we had a go at, from an automotive and from an engineering perspective as well, coming up with our, what we believe is, is a definition for digital twin that works. Um, and I will talk you briefly through this as a way of getting everybody on the same page. And by all means, we can have a discussion around this, either in the chat or afterwards, or even as part of the panelists as to whether you believe this is right or wrong. But this is not the IDE's view. This is a consensus view, um, both from across industry and academia, derived from a bunch of workshops that we've run over the last six months. But our view is a digital twin is a digital representation at the appropriate fidelity of a physical asset and its behavior that is synchronized with its physical counterpart and interrogated to add value. Now, we recognize that one is a long sentence, but secondly, it's quite a complex statement. But each one of those words um, is critical to actually what we believe is a definition. So what we try to do, again, to create a, a yardstick for people to understand what a digital twin is, is break down that definition and say, what do we mean by digital representation? What do we mean by appropriate fidelity? But if I can start almost at the end, what became clear through all the discussions is that the most important word in that whole sentence is that word at the end, and that is value. Uh, the very start, it is really, really important to understand what are you trying to achieve? What insight are you looking for within your organization? Um, and what value are you trying to derive from your program to deliver a digital twin? If you can't ascertain that right at the start, then you're probably on a fool's errand to create a digital twin. Um, so, and again, if we dig down beneath that, the key words that we see, obviously it's a, the, the obvious words are, it's a digital representation of a physical asset. I think most definitions re recognize that that is the twin aspect of it, is digital and physical asset. The, the, the subtleties are in some of the other words. We, we have, and we had lots of debates around the word appropriate fidelity. Um, some schools of thought said actually digital representation should automatically assume appropriate fidelity, but the word appropriate fidelity is critical based on our conversations because, again, we think that has to be proportional to the value you're trying to extract from your digital twin. It will be a fool's errand again to try and build in very high levels of fidelity on every level of data and model and simulation that you're, that you're trying to build if fundamentally it's not going to contribute to the value you're trying to get out um, of, 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 the, of the twin. So that appropriate fidelity, questioning what fidelity do we need for each of the data, um, for each of the models, um, is, is absolutely critical. Um, physical asset recovered, behaviour. Uh, we had many debates about inserting the word behaviour. Quite early on, it became clear a lot of people were trying to suggest that dashboards or digital dashboards representing the state of a physical asset um, was a digital twin. We were really keen to, to differentiate a digital twin from some of those um, dashboards, essentially. So we've inserted the word behavior because we believe a digital twin, if done correctly, um, is there to um, mimic or, or, or replicate behavior in the digital world, but importantly, also potentially to predict behavior in the future. Synchronized, lots of discussions around this as well. Um, the a, a great definition that was the, with where we started actually, which is the AMRC definition, used the word live. Um, that was quite contentious. We've ended up with the word synchronized because I think it has to be synchronized from using data from the real environment. But again, going back to the subject about value, how often it's synchronized, um, um, i.e. I, the frequency of synchronization um, is relative to value that you're trying to create so we've left it a little bit open but this 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 link or this 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 link in having real data from the physical world fed in to the digital representation of that physical world is absolutely key interrogated again this this is an interesting debate that came out at, at relatively late in the discussions the reason why this word isn't there is because we started heading down um, a, a, a sort of a, down a direction that suggested many onboard embedded systems on a product, on a vehicle, were actually digital twins. So we've tried to ensure that those embedded systems themselves don't or aren't perceived as digital twins unless they actually can be interrogated um, by an organization or by, by someone outside of that vehicle to extract that data, extract that learning and make better decisions 
on how that product performs, whether it be battery life, range, performance, or quality, uh, based upon the data that is derived from that embedded system. So interrogate, and again, value we've talked about, but the key to all of this is they need to be, add value, um, right? The value that a digital twin is looking to create has to be ascertained right at the start of the project. So that sets up what our, what our view is. And again, we will run a workshop in October to go into a bit more detail about that. We'll put some stuff on social media. It is our view on what a digital twin is. It, it, it will always be organic. This whole competence around digital twin is organic and we're learning essentially on the job. Um, I think there's, a, there's an, an awful lot of going, work going on across the country, but none more so than the work that Mark Enza is doing. Uh, Mark is head of National Digital Twin Programme um, uh, at CDBB and also CTO of Mock McDonald's. And may I introduce um, Mark to you now? Um, Mark to you now, um, and he will tell you more of what's going on on a national level. Good morning, Mark. Okay, thank you very much indeed for the, for the introduction. It, it's fantastic to be here with uh, such a great group of panellists, actually. I'm really looking forward to the, the conversation. Uh, and I, th I think um, my role is a little bit of a kind of a warm up act, um, hopefully to spark some interest, get the juices flowing, um, maybe be a little bit controversial, like, like Bradley has, has been. Um, but um, to do that, um, by introducing the National Digital Twin Programme, giving an overview of that, maybe picking up on uh, some of the, the points that Bradley made around the definition, which I think is, is really helpful to, to have that definition because then you, you know, it's a, it's a really good starting point, isn't it? Uh, I think that we can move beyond a definition as well and get very good at being able to describe digital twins and maybe we can talk about that too. So anyway, the way that I hope to do this uh, quite briefly um, is to talk about what we mean by the national digital twin, um, uh, describe why it matters uh, and what the national digital twin program is actually doing about it right now as part of this year's program. Uh, so I guess uh, the starting point uh, in talking about the national digital twin uh, is to say that it's not one massive model of everything. It's not trying to be a kind of a huge all encompassing thing. Uh, it's intended to be an ecosystem of connected digital twins, because we can see that there'll be many different digital twins for many different purposes. Uh, and I think uh, Bradley was absolutely right to, uh, to kind of emphasize that, that each, each digital twin really needs to be driven by purpose. Uh, but then we can imagine joining those digital twins together. We, we need the digital twins to speak the same language so they can talk to each other. Uh, but that's really what the National Digital Twin is about. It's uh, an ecosystem of connected digital twins. Um, the context for it, and this is where I'll, I'll move on, um, is the built environment. So this is uh, what our scope has been on the National Digital Twin programme so far. But something that I think is really uh, interesting to note is that everything that we think that we've been learning uh, in the context of looking at connected digital twins in the built environment, we think is absolutely relevant in other sectors. Uh, and we think that there's loads to learn and loads to share from one sector to another. Um, and uh, we, we can see from within the built environment uh, that there are other sectors that are more advanced in certain areas. Um, and we, we think it's really valuable to kind of get that connection, get that learning going. So the, the scope of the National Digital Twin Programme has been the built environment, but we totally see that uh, we can make those kind of connections into other sectors, including advanced manufacturing um, and um, healthcare uh, and defence and food and farming, and you can go on, because basically it's all a system of systems and we need to, um, need, need to see and recognise that. So let me introduce the built environment in those systems terms. Um, we see the built environment as being made up of all sorts of complex interconnected systems. There's the built systems, uh, and so there's economic infrastructure, you know, which includes uh, energy and transport and water and telecoms. Each one of those is complex and interconnected, but then they're connected to each other. Uh, and, and so we see within the built systems uh, this complex interconnected system. But that's then interfacing with our natural systems, which themselves are complex and interconnected. Uh, and now we're starting to, to see the emergence of the cyber physical systems, the kind of the digital version of all of that, which is then 
connected in too. So when you add all of those together, uh, you get this most amazing system of systems of our built environment. Um, probably more amazing than we ever give time to think about. Uh, and I think part of the reason why we don't see it and don't recognize how amazing it is, is because we live in it. Uh, but because we live in it, <laughs> we depend on it. If it doesn't work, then society doesn't work. You know, this, this, this really matters. Uh, and I think particularly if we see, uh, um, you know, in the, the light of what we've learned through the pandemic, you know, we do recognise now, don't we, that, that you know, well-being really matters and that's connected uh, to, to nature. Uh, it's connected to the kind of services we get from, it, from infrastructure. So, so you know, we know this matters. We know we know it has to work. But something that I would really want to emphasise with this kind of systemic view uh, is that an awful lot of the, the big, really big, hairy challenges that we face just now uh, are systemic challenges. So climate change is a systemic challenge. You know, it doesn't uh, just challenge part of the system. It doesn't just rain on transport. You know, it rains on everything. Um, and so uh, climate challenges the whole system, uh, but the whole system matters. Uh, and so what this really means is, is it, it demands systems-based solutions. We, we can't solve this in silos. So if we're wanting to achieve net zero, if we're wanting to achieve climate resilience, if we're wanting maybe in the future to achieve circular economy, all of these are systemic things which, which demand systems-based solutions. So we need ways of understanding and intervening effectively in the system. Um, you know, we, we can't do this in silos anymore. And we need to make those connections. And in particular, what we need to do is have an information flow through the processes across the systems and across the organizations. And that's really what the National Digital Twin Program speaks to. It's helping to provide a competent tool set uh, for this uh, information age uh, where we have systemic challenges and we need systems-based solutions. So if we do look for a moment <coughs> at what those processes are um, in the built environment um, that can potentially benefit from digital twins, uh, we see this kind of infinity loop of processes, if I can put it that way, um, where we know we need that uh, built environment system to, to keep working forever. Uh, and the most important process of all is the one in the center, it's the, the use. It's us getting benefit um, from the built environment within which we live. Uh, and, and very often that particular process gets, kind of gets left off lists of, uh, uh, of built environment processes, which usually begin with planning and uh, then, then think about design. But what I'd like to, to put forward here is actually, there are a lot more processes than that, uh, and they need to be a lot more connected than that. So use is at the center of it, but then we need to operate and maintain our uh, infrastructure to make it available for use. Um, and because that never stops, uh, it means that um, operation and maintenance uh, as systems processes don't have a life cycle. They just go on forever. Uh, we recognize that assets have life cycles, uh, but the system needs to go on forever. And so every now and again, um, we need new assets in the system. And so then we do kick off our planning and designing and building and commissioning. But I think it's really healthy to see that as an intervention on the system to make the system better in some way, rather than just being an isolated project on its own. But, you know, that's not what drives outcomes. And if we are driven by outcomes for people and nature, uh, then we have to see the system delivering that. So we now see kind of all of those interconnected processes and recognize how important it is to have that information flow through the processes. Um, but there's another point here, <clears throat> which I just kind of pick up with a very simple traffic lighty type of thing, which is obviously oversimplified and isn't quite correct, but it, it'll help me to make a point. And, and that's to say that if we do want these systems-based solutions, uh, we need to make the connections. Now, our, our systems, at least physically, are connected. You know, energy is connected into transport. Telecoms is connected into energy. You know, they, they rely on each other, um, at least physically. Uh, maybe there's more connections that can and should be made, but let's just take it for the moment <clears throat> that the, the systems, at least physically, are pretty well connected. Uh, the processes that I've talked about um, are not. Um, very often there's gaps in them. Uh, information doesn't flow freely through them. So that basically it gets in the way of, uh, of a flow of value. So our processes uh, could do better. <clears throat> uh, 
the bit that is really not joined up at all, where the connections really don't kind of work, is, is in our organisations, because we have this amazing interconnected system of systems, uh, uh, which is our built environment, but we choose to manage it in organisations which are basically silos. So if we if we want to address this, this big issue, uh, then we need to make better connections. Uh, and just pointing to the fact that the organisations are, are not connected up and, and it's hard to get information flow across organisational or sector boundaries, um, that points to this issue not just being a technical one. You know, we need to solve those soft issues, the human and organisational factors, in order to actually address this. And, and that's a point I'd really like to emphasise and, and, and come back to. So... When it comes to digital twins, which um, uh, we now know all about, because Bradley did a great, great job of introducing what digital twins are, we can see digital twins with real purpose in every one of those processes on the diagram across uh, across the built environment, um, used to make better decisions, because we see that uh, information um, when it's flowing carries value. Uh, and then the value is released at decision points. Uh, and so digital twins can help to make better decisions faster. Uh, that, you know, that's, that's the point. Uh, but we can make better use decisions, better operation decisions, better maintenance decisions, better design decisions. You, you, you get my point. You can see where I'm going. You can imagine digital twins being used throughout this infinity loop of processes. And then it kind of makes sense that you can join them together. So that's what I'd like to talk about very briefly uh, in uh, in kind of discussing what the national digital twin is and what we what we're doing to go about it. So we, we've already got this definition of a digital twin, haven't we? Where where there's the um, the the digital representation of something physical, and we can see that that can be assets and processes and systems, just like like uh, Bradley said. And the thing that really makes it a digital twin is that dynamic data connection between the model and the things that's being modelled. You know that that's the that's the thing that has changed. Uh, that, that now means we've, we, we can imagine digital twins and imagine them everywhere. So I've just drawn one here um, of, a, of a train, and you can imagine digital twin being used uh, to make better operational decisions for the train. Uh, but then you can imagine the same thing for track and for signaling, uh, which then, then makes you think, oh, why don't we share some data between those different digital twins uh, to inform them better, to make better decisions? But you can make exactly the same kind of argument um, if you step out and look at the uh, data connection potentially uh, between uh, road and rail and air, where some uh, information flow uh, across those would help to make better integrated transport decisions. And you can zoom out again and make exactly the same argument, but now at a, at a sector level uh, and seeing the connection between energy and transport and water, et cetera. Uh, and I think particularly if we are imagining uh, swarms of um, electric autonomous vehicles, you kind of think, well, what, what are they? Are they part of the energy system or part of the transport system? The reality, of course, is, is it's both, which is why we need to have this information flow across organisational and sector boundaries. So, so what I've, I've now described very simply, too simply probably, is, is an ecosystem of connected digital twins. But the heart of it, the thing that makes it work, is that um, secure, resilient information flow across organisational and sector boundaries. So when it comes down to it, you know, if you, if you boil the National Digital Twin down to its essence, that's actually what it's about. It's, a, it's about <laughs> um, some, you know, an information management framework that enables that information flow. Um, in some ways, it's not about digital twins at all. It's about connecting them. Um, the thing is, that if everybody makes all those connections in their own way, and we've got, got multiple bespoke connections, uh, instead of speaking the same language, we'll just have a cacophony of lots of different languages uh, and we'll build friction into the system. So the, the large part of what the National Digital Twin Programme is, is, is focused on is bringing a principled approach uh, so that the digital twins can share a same language. So we're looking at a semantic solution. We think that um, at the core of that is to have a consistent approach to data modelling uh, and shared reference data libraries, uh, shared integration architecture, uh, which would include security protocols and access protocols. Uh, so it's just bringing a principled approach to something that just makes sense. Um, and so I did, did say, and I'm, I'm kind of getting to the end of my, uh, my introduction here, uh, just touch on uh, what the National Digital Twin Programme is actually doing just now about trying to advance this. Um, and I wanted to emphasise 
uh, the, the National Digital Twin Programme really has to be seen and has to be run as a socio-technical change programme. If it's just the technical stuff, we'll have some fantastic technical solutions. But if, if they're not adopted, they're useless. And the adoption piece uh, is at least as important and probably harder than developing the technical stuff. And, and we, we've, got to, we've got to see that and we've got to work on it. Uh, the technical stuff is fun, uh, but it's, you know, and it's, it's absolutely necessary, but it's not sufficient. So we need to see both halves of this uh, and really, I think, as a, as a nation, support, support both halves in each of the sectors that are going to drive this idea of connecting digital twins. So the programme that we have this year um, uh, does pick up on that. Uh, and we have um, <clears throat> the work, the technical work on the information management framework that I, that I said, um, specialist led. Uh, it's helping to develop um, standards uh, and kind of common shared materials uh, that will help to unlock this secure, resilient information sharing. Um, and I think the, the thing there is about collaborating on the rules so that we can compete on the game. It's, it's a market enablement. We want to encourage the market to, to progress, but it, it needs this kind of um, these shared rules uh, so that it's not chaos. Um, and then uh, when it comes to the Kind of the socio side of the of the bargain, um, we've got the DT Hub, the Digital Twin Hub, uh, which we have established. It's community led. Uh, it kind of develops standards uh, more from the bottom up, but those standards are much more to do with guidance and best practice. You know, it's it's, it's what we identify, and so the, the the kind of the motto there is about learning by doing and progressing by sharing. And so this is trying to have. Um, the best of both worlds of top down and bottom up and meeting in the middle and recognizing that you can't have the top down standards unless the, the communities uh, worked worked on it. So it's working with the community to, to do that. And I think that it's the interface um, between uh, and I can't even say what the colors are. It's probably teal and, and purple, isn't it? But between um, social and technical, you know, that, that's where the wonderful stuff happens. Uh, and then the third third piece of our, our program this year uh, is Credo. Uh, this is a climate resilience demonstrator project. Uh, it's really because we recognised that we needed to have a tangible working example of the National Digital Twin. You know, I've I've done I've done what I can in in seven minutes to uh, describe what we mean by it. But that's all kind of conceptual, isn't it? And what we keep hearing from the market is that you know, they want to see it. They want to have an example. Uh, and so uh, with all that stuff I was saying earlier on um, about um, uh, the systemic challenges demanding systems-based solutions, it kind of makes sense that we should be working on climate resilience. Uh, and so what we're actually looking at uh, is a, um, a, a connection between uh, three sectors, uh, water, energy and telecoms uh, and what the response might be um, in relation to uh, a, a climate uh, a climate challenge. So I'll be very, very brief now just to say on the Digital Twin Hub, uh, we've got um, more than 2000 members, uh, a thousand separate organisations from 60 countries. Uh, what they're doing is sharing case studies, um, developing um, events together, um, identifying what priorities are, the early priorities that came from the community is they really wanted case studies and they really wanted examples of business cases. So that's that's what we do because that's what the community wants. Uh, and we've used this community as well to help develop the thin slice uh, of the national digital, digital twin. So community, absolutely essential. Uh, we're looking to expand this, you know, open it up to other sectors to kind of come and do what is fun for you. Uh, so it would be wonderful to have uh, the aut automotive sector in there, you know, doing your own stuff, uh, but also advanced manufacturing and wider. Uh, the community's uh, grown significantly um, over the period of time. We think it's really important when it comes to uh, who's in the community that there are uh, both kind of demand side and supply side on digital twins. So people are going to buy digital twins, but also those who sell products and services into the market and those who bring good ideas from the academic community. Um, when it comes to Credo, uh, I've already kind of stolen my own thunder on this about what it's about. But the, the thing that maybe I, I, I should just say is that we realise that we need to tell the story at a number of different levels. So I'll just uh, take a moment on that and, and, and wrap up. Um, we see that, um, that this whole thing does exist at a number of levels. So at a technical level, you know, we, we need to know that it's possible, that we can actually do this, have secure, resilient information flow across 
uh, sector boundaries. It's hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Uh, but so therefore, we need to be able to show and tell the story about it being possible to do it. Uh, at a domain level, so actually you're within the, the kind of the management of the uh, the sectors themselves. We need to show that it's meaningful, that it's helpful in in actually running those sectors. You know, and, and what would the response be to um, a, a severe flood and cascade failure across those sectors that I talked about? You know, they need to be able to make better decisions. Otherwise, there's no point in doing this. So it needs to be meaningful at a domain level. Uh, at a policy level, we, we need to convince that it's necessary, that we need this, and, and that you know, this is not actually optional anymore. If we want to solve some of those big systemic challenges, we need these systems-based solutions. So, so you know, this is an essential enabler, and we jolly well need it. So as a country, we're going to jolly well do it. So you know, at a policy level, we, we need to show that it's, it's necessary. And then I think at a public level as well, um, we, we kind of need um, us as citizens to say, we want this. You know, it's imperative. <laughs> we, we don't want our, um, our built environment within which we live, which is essential for society. We don't want it falling over if it rains too much. Um, so we need, we need the public to kind of get it uh, and say, we want it. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up with that. Um, I've got loads more that I, I, I want to say, but I'm hoping that maybe in the conversation we'll come back around to it. Uh, and, and what I what I uh, I hope from run through running through that so, so briefly is that we've got we've got some meat to come and talk about. So, Bradley, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Brilliant. Uh, honestly, fantastic presentation. Um, just a few comments and, and actually just to drive that start the conversation a little bit. I think you and I met probably six months ago when when I attended an event and you attend an event and it was very clear that we were talking the same language and I think it's it, it, your point around uh, the sector boundaries having to come down if we're generally going to um, within the UK at least lead the definition of future architectures around our built environment and I think there's also a, a myth certainly I probably was foul of this myself when I heard the term built environment I thought it was something that came, came from the construction industry and only was relevant to the construction industry. I think when you talk about the built environment, it's basically the world we live in around us. And that has to include um, products, services from every sector. So, and I, and I think we've got a real advantage here within the UK is to, with, with what you're doing through DT Hub, through the National Digital Twin Programme, if we can define that common language, that taxonomy that helps bring down those, those boundaries, which to be fair, will be data boundaries more than anything else, um, that then we've got a real chance of maybe leading some of these new net zero solutions. I think from some of my frustration within the automotive sector, we still a little bit, we're getting a lot better, think too much about cars, um, where we need to be thinking about cars in the context of um, energy supply and distribution, telecoms, and the infrastructure it's charged on. Um, and, and I think that is a massive transition we need to make within the automotive se sector. Um, and I, I suggest, I, I, I fear it's similar in other sectors. We're very good at some degree operating in silos, but with digitalization and with digital twins, we've got to start bringing those boundaries down and sharing data across sectors and modeling and simulating and creating digital twins of, of those system of systems um, before we rush headlong into actually engineering and developing the, the, the products and services. We need to ensure that they are going to be the right, relevant, environmentally friendly um, uh, and fit, fit for customer um, solutions. Yes, I, I think, I, well, you, you know, I think that's exactly right. We, we, we agree very strongly on, on this. I mean, I, I, there's a point in, in there that I think is just worth bringing out, actually, about, about um, what is, is an appropriate response for us and how we can do this thing. Uh, and, I, and the point I'm wanting to make is that I think um, this is too complex to be controlled. Uh, you, we, we, don't, we don't have a hope of doing that. So with the, um, the built environment, it, it is a complex, emergent, adaptive system of systems. It can't be controlled. You know, <laughs> system science would tell you that. It can't, can't be. But what we can do is understand it better and intervene better to deliver better outcomes. It, it's, it's a different thing from controlling it. And I think in exactly the same way, when it comes to making these connections between organizations, uh, 
That's something that people won't stand for command and control structure to make it that work. What we need to be doing is making connections and coordinating. It's not like one person's the boss and telling everyone what to do. Uh, what we need to do is just make connections uh, and encourage you know, different sectors to do their stuff, but make the connections. Yeah. Uh, and I think that this is really important. You know, it's, it's, a, it's about being able to understand the system better and intervene more effectively. Perfect. No, that's brilliant. And, and, I, and again, your point, I know we we're sort of in violent agreement on the, on the, uh, the, the technology quite often isn't the thing that's getting in the way. It, it's culture, people and, and resistance to change. And, and, and um, uh, yeah, I, I agree that that is more than more than half the battle. Um, so if I can encourage everybody, the DT Hub is a fantastic resource. It, it is it is free. Yeah, there's there's some amazing companies on there, uh, demonstration showcasing some amazing things that they're doing. Um, and actually, we're delighted to have a few of them with us today, actually, we're going to talk about what they're doing. But Mark, I know you'll join us for the panel shortly, but thanks ever so much for, for as always, um, and, and, and a fantastic presentation. So I think let's move into what we're going to do is with each of the panelists, they're going to do a brief introduction of themselves, um, give a few slides or, or, or a bit of a talk about um, what the digital twin means for them uh, and what value or not. They, they perceive in a digital twin. So I think to kick us off, can I welcome Louise Krug from British Telecom? And Louise, do you wanna introduce yourself and briefly discuss digital twin from your perspective? Yeah, hi. So uh, BT is one of the world's leading communication service provider companies. We're serving the needs of customers in the UK and more than 170 countries worldwide with fixed line services, broadband, mobile TV products, networked IT services, wholesale services. And we've long had an interest in climate change. Essentially, we provide essential communication services, that's traffic lights, flood alert systems, the emergency service network. So we're part of the UK's critical national infrastructure. And as such, we need to keep those services up and running, especially during climate events such as floods and storms, when localised demand can spike. And climate change is a concern, therefore, because it makes extreme weather events much more likely and that can affect our services. But that also means we're in an uncomfortable cycle with climate change driving demand for electricity and communication services that leads us to add more infrastructure to ensure sufficient capacity, cooling and resilience. And that in turn drives more climate change. And low BT buys clean energy, limiting our electricity use and carbon emissions will help prevent this climate change. And we know that our products and services are used by customers in ways that reduce emissions overall, and we estimate that the emissions saved from our products, from teleconferencing to agricultural management, is more than three times our total emissions. And internally today, we use less electricity now than we did back in 1997. Um, and we've done a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of work to get to that stage. Um, but given the, the sort of scale and complexity of our business, identifying what actions will be the most effective gets ever harder. And many of the early actions were driven by my work in developing models to help us understand our energy use. And over time, some very simplistic models, literally written on the back of a bit of paper, have developed into something that's now actually a digital twin of our system. But the energy twin isn't the only digital twin we have within BT. We are developing one to help with training, for example, upskilling new recruits before letting them loose in a real exchange where a configuration error could impact thousands of users. Um, and this diversity of experience is helping us understand some of the common features, elements and challenges of digital twins. And we've got our own little model of what we think twins look like. Underpinning everything is always the data, getting sufficient data of the necessary accuracy and timeliness. So I think links back to something that um, Bradley was saying. Um, and then the second layer we consider is how we present the information, creating relevant solutions, preventing brain overload and enabling a natural interaction between the user and the system. And then understanding your application helps determine what detail is needed in that modeling and the requirements on the data la the layers. And then finally, Mark uh, mentioned the National Digital Twin and talked about the Credo project. Um, BT is one of the participants in that Credo project. And I'm really interested in finding out how interconnecting the different digital twins from different sectors could help us identify better climate risks, uh, better mitigate against climate um, problems and future opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. We look forward to you joining us on the panel as well, where I'm sure you'll have some interesting questions. I think, like I said, it's um, 
it blew my mind when when you told me that you know the level of uh, consumption that BT has as an organisation as part of the national grid grid that one percent figure uh, I had no idea uh, so I can understand it being um, a, a, a definitely a, a a cause for investigation and understanding within BT both from a, a cost point of view which quite often let, let's let's be real about it is is quite often the, the primary driver within an organisation. But obviously, importantly, as, as, as well now from an, from an environmental standpoint. Uh, so thank you, Louise. OK, uh, moving on, our second panelist um, and is, is well known to some of you is Jose Garcia Orucci, um, app, who's basically leads digital engineering capability for Jaguar Land Rover. Hi, Jose, and welcome. And over to you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Bradley. So in Jaguar Land Rover, we, we are an automotive company. We make Jaguars, Land Rovers and Range Rovers. The concept of digital, digital twin is not very new in the automotive industry. We have been combining physical and digital for quite some time. The, the models that you can see in the background of our new Land Rover Defender, both of them are made of clay. They are not, they are not real cars. The design process still relies very heavily on physical. So we make models out of clay, but at the same time, we, we keep a digital representation of those, of those physical models all the time. When it comes to engineering the car, it's a very similar story. We use computer-assisted design, so CAD and computer-assisted engineering, CAE, very extensively. We will, we will develop the cars in a, in a digital world for the first 12 to 18 months of the development cycle. We will not have physical prototypes that are working, so we will be relying on, on computer simulation in order to engineer our cars. And we'll be using physical testing and physical prototypes in, in order to keep the two of them in sync. Having said that, the, the digital twin has been, has been limited uh, historically to, to when the dealer when the car leaves the dealer. So we usually have a, we have had in the past a digital representation all the way from concept, as you can see in the background with those clay models, all the way to the car leaving the, leaving the dealer. Increasingly more, what we are trying to do is we are trying to extend the life cycle of the digital twin. So not only to have a digital representation during the development phase, but also to have a digital representation while the car is in service. With the card that I've got in my background, the Land Rover Defender, that is the first card that we release and that is, that is connected all the time. So these cars, we've got a connection to them. We can talk to the car while they are in service. And the car can benefit from software upgrades without having to go to a dealer. So we can push the, the software over the air. So what we are trying to accomplish increasingly is a model of the car as it is being used. But this is a much more difficult problem because the car lives in a wider environment. As Mark was mentioning earlier, the challenge that we've got over here is the one of system of systems. Um, and also the challenge is that we still are not capable of having a digital model of the whole car. We've got digital models of the electric system. We'll have a, a, a digital twin of the mechanical system, but we still are, have not been able to create a model of the whole electro, electronic and mechatronic uh, model. Also, with the arrival of autonomy and autonomous cars, the need to have a digital twin in the context of a wider system becomes even more important. In the automotive industry, we are no longer questioning whether the digital twin is required or not required. It's an intrinsic part of our strategy, it's our future, it's our way is our way to reduce development cycle, is our way to also control the cars while they are in service with predictive maintenance. So we are no longer, no longer questioning the value of the digital tool. We have been using it for a while and our intent is, our intent is to grow as much as, as we possibly can the digital twins to make sure that they capture the whole life cycle and that we can understand the car in their environment. But as Mark was saying earlier, 
one of the major, one of the biggest problems that we are finding is, is, is flow of data across the different systems. We haven't, we haven't got the benefit of starting from a greenfield environment. We have been doing this for quite some time, almost a hundred years. We've got some systems uh, which are now uh, 30, 40 year old. It's difficult to get the data to flow across the different systems. We conceptually can see how we do it and, and conceptually we can see most of the technology being, being available to do this, but still we need to overcome major difficulties. When we start talking about system of systems, we have to rely and integrate our, our digital twins into the wider digital twins for which we will need the standards, for, we will, for which we will need uh, protocols that enable us to do that. It's all very exciting. We are investing quite a lot of money in this, in this technology and we will continue to do so in the near future. We are not unique in the automotive industry in that respect. So pretty much every single manufacturing uh, manufacture or any single uh, manufacturing company in the world is doing this. So for us, it's a matter of survival. We must have better and more comprehensive uh, digital twins that enable us to understand the, the, our products across the whole of the life cycle from inception, from idea, all the way to the disposal of the vehicle. Brilliant. Jose, thank you very much indeed. Um, and again, great example with the Defender there, um, which obviously is the car we look forward to seeing at the end of the month, I think, in the James Bond film. Yeah. I've just seen you've launched some James Bond editions, which are, uh, are extremely appealing, and obviously alongside some Aston Martins, I'm sure, as well. Um, well we are also taking orders. <laughs> Thanks, Jose. And I'm sure, I know we'll have some questions coming in from you as well, but thank you very much for your presentation. You. We'll see you shortly. Um, Okay, our next panelist um, is uh, Peter Van Manen, uh, who's got uh, some very interesting insights around Formula One um, through a number of different examples, actually. So, Peter, are you able to join us? Yeah, I'm here. Brilliant, you're there. Excellent. Peter, over to you. Right, good morning, everyone. So, I'm going to give a brief introduction. I work at Fresh Nash on digital twins and autonomy projects. And I worked for about 22 years in at McLaren, and we were doing control and data systems, for Formula One. Um, used digital twins for many years. Uh, we started using them in Formula One probably around mid 1990s uh, as decision support tools, and they've become quite commonplace for the last 15 years. So all of the teams use uh, various types uh, around the grid. Um, digital twins are used for helping to develop the race car, which changes throughout the season, for managing the life of the engines and the gearboxes, which there are a limited number that are available throughout the season, and also for optimizing the tires and the fuel usage uh, for the pit stops during the races themselves. The digital twins generally are looking at the state and behavior of the race car and they're fed with telemetry data coming from the cars. So all of these cars are sending data uh, across via high-speed telemetry links. It's about 2 billion data points uh, coming across during the two-hour race. They're also feeding off the, uh, the lap time information for all of the cars. So there's about, across 20 cars, there's about 6,000 data points uh, during a race weekend. Common metric in motor racing is lap time. So you're trying to uh, reduce your lap time to get across the, uh, the finish line first. And uh, the desired outcome, if you boil it down, is, uh, as with most things, is money. Um, you want to get the maximum number of championship points because the position where you win, uh, where you're left at the end of the championship determines how much television money you get, how much sponsorship you get, etc. Uh, just to put that in context, if you uh, if you move up a place, say you move from fourth to third in the World Championship, it's worth about ten to fifteen million dollars, and uh, it also helps you attract more sponsors as well. So at Fraser Nash, um, we use digital twins in our defence, energy, and transport business. Um, some of it's used for shaping policy and strategy, some of it's for managing assets, and some of it is for assurance. So there's the three 
the three sort of big buckets of use cases that we use. Um, oftentimes it's about life extension. So it's using, trying to get more <clears throat> out of an asset that exists. And so that boils down to using the digital twin to look at deterioration to determine when it is safe to continue using an asset or when you need to change the behavior of it. Uh, an example, we use it for a OEM who um, provides gas turbines. He's got a fleet of about 15,000 gas turbines across the, the world. And we've used digital twins to move from a time-based to a condition-based uh, maintenance uh, regime. And what's quite cute about that is it's using uh, real-time data that comes from the turbine control system. And the digital twin is allowing you to uh, look inside the turbine and determine the damage of the blades. So uh, you know, a common use of digital twins is uh, using data that you can measure to create a surrogate for data that you're really interested in. Uh, there's, there's quite a lot of activity that goes into de developing a twin like this. It's, it's sort of taken a number of years, uh, but they, uh, although it is quite, um, quite a complex task to develop a meaningful twin. Uh, in this particular case, it pays for itself within about two years. And the prize is about a five times uh, return on investment after five years. And that prize is worth many millions of dollars. So once you, uh, once you get the attention of, a, of a, a client for the use of digital twins, there's actually a very big payback. So, um, that's me. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Peter. It's fantastic hearing you quote some, I know I recognise obviously a lot of it's commercial and confidence, some value for money um, ratios there. And that, that's sometimes one of the biggest things uh, in this space is getting, I think people are starting to understand there is value. Being able to quantify it is difficult because it, there, are, there are not enough big case studies out there that can show that five times sort of return on investment figure. Um, yeah. I mean, if you take, um, take Formula One, for example, the, the digital twins that are used for developing the car probably save around about 40% in cost and just by reducing waste. Uh, now, Formula One, they, they still spend the money, they just spend it on other <laughs> things. But, uh, you, you have to save that money to be able to invest in other things. And so 30 or 40%, uh, I think, is, is uh, a reasonable goal for anyone in looking at this stuff yeah no it's an it's an, an interesting figure actually and that's sort of roughly where where there's a from a few different angles that 30 40 percent is a common number um so um are, are certainly around digitalization and in the broader context of what we think could be saved as part of a product development program for a vehicle uh through applying digital science and technology that that's sort of where through a different number of different angles we're coming out but it, it again, it is still difficult to articulate it very clearly as a, a base value for money statement sometimes. Um, well, yeah, and I think also within the context of uh, COP26 and net zero, uh, I would contend you won't get net zero without digital twins, full stop. No, uh, it's good to hear. I, I'm completely with you, obviously. Um, but, 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 but I think the more people that realise that, the better. I, I agree. Leadership in delivering net zero um, net zero architectures will not come without digitalization and understanding and developing digital twins. I totally agree with you. We just can't, we can't handle the level of, of complexity that we're facing on these new architectures without moving stuff into a, into a digital environment. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you, Peter. And again, you'll join us shortly for the panel. Um, moving on to our last panelist. Uh, and again, slightly slightly tangential, but but really fascinating. It is and Michael's going to join us. Uh, Michael Konacek um, from Build Media and AccuCities is 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 going to take us to a slightly different place about how what what is the role for visualization and maybe even gaming engines in in bringing in digital twins to life. Um, Michael, over to you. Oh, thank you, Bradley. So my name is Michael, and I'm from AccuCities. So AccuCities is a London-based 3D city modeling agency. Um, and we work mostly with architects and urban planners. So the way uh, our company operates is basically in two branches. The first branch is the 3D mapping operation, and it creates the 3D model data itself, and we use a stereo um, manual photogrammetry. 
Uh, this is because uh, simply the previously available 3D city models were just not good enough for our customers in terms of accuracy and so on. So uh, our city model data sets need to be um, updated and upgraded all the time. Uh, see on the, um, here you can see on the small section of our model, how much there was of a change from 2016 to 2020 and also to 2027. So our 3D city models are used for a wide range of applications. Here we can see it for pedestrian wind comfort modeling. It's been used for um, uh, designing 5G networks, for transient uh, shadowing assessments. Uh, we also use it for facade reflection studies to simulate the uh, uh, train uh, driver's comfort. We can 3D print it, and it was also used in uh, virtual field trips and so on. Now, the second branch of our operation, the data exploitation branch, is mostly focused on our Unreal Engine 4 powered app uh, called Plan City. Here we can, for example, clear a site, import or create a building. And once we have a new structure uh, imported, we can uh, use some of the tools that we have developed to exploit the data set. Uh, the view shared tool, for example, uh, can instantly tell us where we will be able to see this new structure from. So understanding of the area of potential visibility is obviously very important for compliance with local uh, planning regulations. And on the map, you can see in yellow uh, where you will be able to see the building from. Uh, it's not actually painted on the ground, it's painted on a plane lifted to an average high level. Uh, this is the sky analysis tool, and it can give us a quick indication of potential issues with uh, blocking of too much visible sky. Uh, now, this is normally calculated at the um, uh, middle point of a window, but this kind of um, a uh, study can take days, even weeks, so we can do it in two to three minutes. And this is now the latest uh, uh, ver uh, version of our 3D London model, which will be textured, as you can see. Uh, now, this will allow our customers to use the model on many more applications. Uh, this is one of them, uh, for example, uh, to visualize, visualize the views from a plant um, restaurant on top of a, a, a new design building. Thanks, Michael. M much appreciated. So, uh, so I think, uh, again, I'm sure you have some questions around that. So I, I think that's taking us a different direction. But my my view, and I think you're, you're making a business out of it, is, is how do you apply gaming engines to sometimes, um, you know, digital twins can be complex. And I think part of their success will be how do we make them relevant to stakeholders? Stakeholders aren't always computer scientists. Or, or technologists, they're quite often more senior individuals, um, and they like to be able to see things. So, so, so quite often. So, I think I think you're pushing the boundaries a little bit now towards how do we apply gaming engine technology and make these digital twins as they emerge more digestible to people oh. who maybe are not um, digital experts. Absolutely, absolutely. And we use the game engines as a physics engines. Uh, so they they enable us to combine a lot of data uh, from uh, from three D um, geometry all the way to live data, live camera feeds, and so on, um, and, and 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 present them in a one com comprehensible uh, package. That's fantastic, and I think you know um, what we uh, we speak a lot to Epic Games, um, Unreal Engine, which you know, and I know you, you're you're a partner of Unreal, I believe. Um, and I think this is just the start. There are many other examples around the world um, that we obviously can't talk about today, where, where there's a big pull from, from gaming engine suppliers, whether it be Unity, obviously there are other, other gaming engine suppliers, um, as well as Unreal, to actually, um, to actually start bringing uh, people's digital twins to life. There's some great examples that are online. Um, and again, I, I do suggest you, you get in touch um, with the DT Hub that Mark talked about earlier. There's so some more examples on there as well. But Michael, thank you very much indeed. Heartening to see there's a hell of a conversation going on in the chat um, about this stuff. So it's really sparked lots of conversation and lots of fantastic, very detailed questions that we're trying to synthesize down now uh, and get people to come and ask questions. Um, so I, I think if, I'm, if I might uh, ask questions first while, while we sort out the, the, the right questions to bring in from the audience. Jose, Jose can I start with you, if I may? Um, you know, as, as the automotive representative on the panel, um, obviously you're starting the journey on digital twin development. There's some great examples. To what degree do, does the Jaguar Land Rover strategic team 
uh, understand the value in, in digital twins in in unlocking new business models or deriving their corporate strategy? Is, is it still a sort of in the pilot phase or is this now embedded as a core part of where Jaguar Land Rover is going? It is totally embedded. It, it, is, it, is, it is very a very strategic element for, for the company. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, we are not debating uh, whether this is useful or not anymore. Uh, what we want to do is, is develop the digital twin that covers the whole life cycle as soon as we possibly can. Uh, we are everybody in the industry is doing this. It is essential to remain competitive. And, and, and yeah, as I said, the investment that we are putting in is very sin significant. It's probably the single most strategic, strategic program that we've put in place. Brilliant. No, that, that's superb. And, and Luis, if I can come to you again as sort of as a, as a big corporate player, BT. So, similarly, I, obviously, I, I know your, your initiative didn't start as a digital twin. And to some degree, you've been pulled into now it being a, a fairly comprehensive digital twin. From a BT sort of enterprise perspective, is, is this something that they recognize as in its importance to make better decisions as an enterprise or is it, is it experimental at this stage? Um, well, the Energy Twin is now actually being fully downstreamed into our, our finance department and they're responsible for um, the general maintenance and, and running of it. We're expanding it, we're building on it, we're doing um, new developments all the time, but it's, it's, it's been embedded as part of the day-to-day -day process um, within finance. And I think the success we've had with that model um, has helped um, sort of promote the idea of concept of digital twins around the business as a way forward. And there's a lot more um, thought going into um, how we um, manage our data, make it more accessible um, to, to various people um, so that, you know, various different twins can, can be built up um, more easily um, to make more use of this, this kind of approach. Fantastic. Well, that, that is always a sign of success. If your finance <laughs> team and your CFO has woken up, then well, that answers the question whether there's value in it usually. Um, <laughs> to Peter's point earlier, uh, if it's embedded within your finance system, then there's got to be value. Um, that's really good to hear. Okay, what we're going to do, um, I've got other questions as well, but, but actually we're getting quite a lot of questions coming in from our audience. So I'm going to try and prioritise those over some of those that, that, that we, ha we had ready to go. Um, I'm hoping the team, my excellent team behind me, are going to be able to bring Rob Akers live um, Rob, I, who I know, I work quite closely with Rob. Rob, Rob um, works for UK AEA, um, um, and I believe has a question. Rob, are you able to join us live? Yeah, can you hear me? Ah, look at that, by the magic of digital. Um, Rob, who do you want to ask your question to? Um, so it was Mark, but I guess it was um, to the other members of the panel as well, if, if they wish to answer. Um, so... Mark, you, you painted a really exciting picture of digital twins in terms of these very complex system of systems problems. Um, and I think the picture you painted was largely around being able to interrogate those systems and perhaps fill in the gaps where we don't have measurements of those systems in order to uh, make inferences um, around what is going on in the real world. Um, but for me, digital twins have real power when they become predictive of the future. And I don't think you really touched on that too much. But I guess what I worry about is that to make predictive digital twins, um, I guess akin to the sort of thing that the Met Office does with its predictive simulations for the Earth's weather, um, we need a revolution, if you like, in the way we do uncertainty quantification at scale and, and, and many other missing pieces, in fact, around statistics and probability theory. Um, and I, I, I just worry a little bit that um, the government will expect us to deliver near-term benefits. And so there'll be a lot of investment in the more pragmatic, perhaps lower fidelity digital twins that, of course, are going to have great, you know, uses. Um, but I just worry that there's not going to be the investment needed in the uncertainty quantification, the mathematics, the statistics, the informatics that is going to be needed to make those predictive digital twins. So I, I don't know whether you can uh, put my mind to rest around that or maybe say a few words about that about perhaps what we should be thinking about doing. In terms uh, of yes, I, 
I uh, thank, thanks, Rob. I I, um, I can say a few words. Whether I'll put your mind at rest is a, is another matter altogether. Um, I think uh, you are absolutely right, though, about the uh, potential use of digital twins for um, predictive analytics. I think that's that's exactly right. Um, I don't think that will be for all digital twins. It go, goes back to. Yeah, one of the points that at, at the top of Bradley's introduction, actually, that, that it should, should be driven by purpose. And, and if, if part of the purpose is, is to help us uh, make better decisions um, through having that predictive view, that then that should therefore be built into that digital twin. But um, the point I was making is that there'll be different digital twins for different purposes. Some uh, might be predictive. So, so I, I'm completely agreeing with you that, that we need that. Uh, and then... Uh, when it comes to um, kind of developing the state of the art or maybe the state of the science in there, uh, I agree. There's loads more research which is needed to, to get those kind of high fidelity twins and, and understand and manage uncertainty. I, I completely agree with that. Um, one of my other points, and I think this is, a, this is a, an important one, uh, is that we need to be moving on a lot of fronts at once. Uh, so I think that when it comes to... to research that there's a lot of research needs in digital twins we should absolutely encourage that but if all we do is the research um then we'll kind of miss out on an awful lot of the uh, the, the near-term value so mm -hmm. i i don't think that we're in a place where we can kind of do a one or the other mm -hmm. we, we need both you know, so so we need a proper integration between what's happening uh, in government and academia and industry. You know, we need to make those connections too. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I think that this whole program uh, needs to be led by connection and coordination, not command and control. For, for me, that's a really important point. But that those kind of connections can be cross-sector connections. So if there's some fantastic research in predictive analytics in, in one particular area, it can benefit another. So, so, so I think, you know, potentially the DT hub could be used to, to help make those connections. It's not there at the moment, but we could make it so. Um, then um, when it comes to um, kind of uncertainty specifically, uh, I think that there's an enormous amount that we need to do to, to get to understand uncertainty uh, and its relationship to decisions. Because I think um, a, a lot of the panelists, it felt to me, were heading in the same direction. You know, we kind of agree that what this is all about is making better decisions faster. You know, the decisions is where the value gets unlocked. Uh, but those decisions always have to be made uh, in the presence of some kind of uncertainty. So you know, we, we need to really understand decision theory uh, and how we make decisions and how much uncertainty is is acceptable and in some places in some cases it will be kind of very little and in other cases we had to make decisions in the presence of loads of uncertainty but I think uh, it's really nice to know kind of going back to some of the fundamentals of information theory that information fundamentally you know is that that stuff that destroys uncertainty so we've got information we've got uncertainty we've got decisions um, yeah we need to sort it out um, so the final point I would make is just about um, you, you, your worry about where government might be going on this. Uh, what I would say on that is, you know, I've, I've got no control over that whatsoever. Uh, but but now is exactly the right time to be making those noises because there's all sorts of bids going through CSR. We don't know where they're going to get to. Um, but, you know, we've got six months until the next funding starts. You know, the current funding ends, the next funding starts. So I, I would say that if you've got some good ideas as to how the future should look, uh, now is a really good time to be uh, making those representations. Brilliant. Mark, thank you. And Rob, thank you for your question. I, I hope that goes some way to answer it. Um, and I know you've got loads more because I can see you, the conversation on chat, but we'll have to leave it there for, for that one uh, so, so we can move on to another caller. But thanks for your question and thanks for your answer, Mark. Um, we're going to, again, Get an audience caller. Um, I think we're trying to bring Peter McToll next. I'm hoping I'm saying your name right, Hope Peter. Peter, you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Thanks, Peter. Who's your question to? Um, it's, re it's really to the whole panel. Uh, thanks, Barley. Um, and to, just to, to, to build on, firstly, thank you very much for some really good insights today. Um, it's been very useful, but 
To build on what Jose had mentioned earlier on about the flow of data in Brownfield sites and Louise mentioned about making data more accessible and so on, I think the digital twin movement is, is great in the UK, but looking at Brownfield adoption is, is where, is where there's, there's a lot of value as well. There's a lot of data that's, that's being built up in legacy assets um, that, 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 can, that can be used for predictive and for digital twin and so on. However, it can be it it can be made cost prohibitive uh, to to actually get access to that data by by the machine vendors. Um, and and really, if we're going to break down the barriers for in the adoption of digital twin and and uh, getting value from these assets, we have to make this easier to adopt. Because uh, quite often, the decision to to access data from these machines it it hangs in the balance for 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 SMEs who may or may not see the value in it and. The smallest barrier gets in the way um, and they decide that it's not worth doing. Uh, so it's really how, what's the panel's views and how we could basically put pressure on whoever needs to be put pressure to, to, to make the data that's being generated within manufacturing sites more available to, to the people who are actually going to be trying to get value from them going forward in the future. Can I pick up on, on that? <laughs> this whole yes, problem please. of legacy has been an absolute nightmare for for what I've trying, been trying to do. Um, you know, we've, we've got some very modern systems, but we've got an awful lot of stuff um, with information in people's heads and uh, information on paper. And um, to be honest, um, I've taken quite a pragmatic approach. Um, we use the, the information streams when we can get hold of them. Um, we use modeling and, 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 and techniques to sort of fill in the gaps. And what I found is sort of going around the cycle is that as people have been able to see some of the benefits and, uh, from doing the work, it's been easier to get them to make the necessary changes um, to, to systems to allow us to actually sort of start to incorporate the data in a, a more dynamic and, and sensible way. But we haven't been able to achieve that with every um, data source that we would like to have and so we've just had I've gone very much for we get the most value by having a, a complete even if it's not a perfect picture we can still get a lot of value from that um, so that's the sort of approach we've taken with handling legacy yeah I, I would agree with you Louise I think that the um, which also comes back to Rob's earlier question if you can build the sort of the physics and the uncertainty around the data that you have got, you can deal with the imperfection of the data. And you can almost shame people into then adding their data afterwards when they see how well you're doing without it. They say, well, actually, I'll, I'll give it to you now. And you can also use <clears throat> different data sets to help infer some of the gaps and identify where there are problems. I and mean, that also comes from sort of fixing the quality of the data, which can be very variable, particularly when you're talking about legacy systems. So you can start to bring them all together and say, that's got to be wrong. Yeah, the good thing about digital twins, it, it removes that roadblock where it says, you know, if I don't have the data, I can't do anything. Well, the answer is you can. You can, mm -hmm. you can use other data, other information. As I would say, you, you've got, you've, again, JLR are quite an established com company. Have you had any issues with legacy data? Yeah, we do. And, and Peter, that's a, it's a wonderful question. Um, in our case, we we started this transformation primarily because of Tesla. And they came to the market and they had a greenfield environment. They were lucky enough to have a greenfield environment. Whereas in automotive, uh, it took a while to get going because it's just very difficult to make the investment. Uh, enabling a digital twin is, is extraordinarily expensive, particularly when you've got legacy systems. So most OEMs in the industry have been delaying this for, for quite a while. But then Tesla came along and they started from a greenfield environment. They started to take more and more of the market. So it kind of became a survival thing to do. All of a sudden, we couldn't postpone it any longer. We acknowledged that we had problems with the legacy systems. But there was no choice. We had to do this because the development times for Tesla kept coming down. Their integration in their integration of software and hardware was really, really good, much better than anybody else had in the industry. So the investment 
the investment became a very strategic thing. It was out of necessity. We, we couldn't, in order to survive, we had to do this. And that's when most of the industry, ourselves included, started investing millions and millions, and we continue to do so every single year to enable the digital twin. Fantastic. Thank you. And thank you very much for the question. Um, let us move on to the next question. Again, we're not short of questions, which is great. So getting through them is going to be the issue. Um, can we? Can my team bring Bing G um, on on live? There he is. Excellent. Bing, who's your? If you if 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 it's for the panel, then say it's for the panel. Or if it's to a specific individual, um, what is your question? Who's it to? Yeah, I have got a question to Jules. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Bing. <laughs> oh, yep. Okay, great. Yeah. So when we consider a product or system, say a car from uh, 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 from a Land Rover, and uh, when we considering you know the car through its lifetime from design testing you know to the uses and the service, lots of data has been generated already. So they are already there, and uh, we we might or might not use it. And uh, my question, you know, uh, to Joe is, uh, to what level, to what extent of the details you would like, you know, to uh, dig out the, uh, uh, the the potential of the data to generate the value from the data and use it for the digital twin. For example, uh, you, you can say I, I will stop, you know, at the uh, tier one supply level for the subsystem, or I can go to the, uh, you know, tier two. Uh, supplier down the line for uh, components like you know uh, some uh, capacitors, uh, mo motors uh, in in your system. So this is my question. Okay, it's quite a wide question. Let me see whether I I can answer it. So in terms of the supply chain, um, we we are already using digital twins in order to model the factories and the assembly lines. So that happens primarily virtual now. Uh, so, and wherever possible, we are also trying to model the, the supply chain. So it's this kind of system of systems, but this is not of the car in, in when it is operational. This is in the, in the design phase, where wherever possible, we try to model the supply chain. So when it comes to the use of the data itself, when the vehicle is in service, um, all of our cars, with the exception of one, but that will come out of, of, of production uh, in the next few months, uh, already are connected all the time. So the first example was the Land Rover Defender in the background uh, a couple of years ago. Now, the, the problem that we've got there is that technology allows us to get a lot of data from the sensors. With the arrival of 5G, that's going to increase enormously. It is an issue of how to make the most of the data. One of the things that we are trying to do is, or what we are doing is trying to do predictive maintenance of the cars. So instead of having your scheduled services, and so have your maintenance done depending on, on your own vehicle, on your own individual vehicle, so that wherever possible, we can push fixes or resolve problems remotely. And or we have a more bespoke approach to maintenance where we can we try to minimize the disruption to the to the to the drivers or the owners. So, but the problem that we've got, and this is related to a previous question around uncertainty and probabilistics, because of the amount of choices that the customer have for the car in terms of the hardware, in terms of the software. In some, in some cases, in some of our models, we've got billions of possible combinations for a, given, for a given model. So all of a sudden, having a digital twin for every single individual car is extraordinarily difficult. So the problem of probabilistics, uh, it, is, it is starting to become more and more important. We are trying hard at uh, unlocking the value of digital twin. And we kind of feel that technologically, most of the ingredients are in place, but bringing it all together is extraordinarily difficult from a technical point of view. Ben, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you, yeah. 
Yeah, I think Mark, Mark, you've got your hand up. Do you want to make a comment against that? Yeah, just a, just a, a brief one. It's, it's just to um, kind of maybe ex expand our thinking on on what can be a digital twin in this space in in order to solve some of some of these problems. So, so I think that um, it, it's kind of easy for us to imagine the the digital twin of a car, but then we can also imagine the digital twin of the robots in the factory. We can imagine a digital twin of the whole factory. Uh, we can imagine digital twin of the supply chain um, uh, because uh, if we see digital twins of being of assets and processes and systems, uh, then you know it, it is possible to look at an organization as a collection of processes, kind of a digital twin of an organization, a digital twin of multiple organizations interacting with each other in a supply chain. So, so, so really the, you know, the, the opportunity for connected digital twins in this space is also huge. Uh, you know, we should we shouldn't limit ourselves by uh, by imagination here. And but but I think what it comes back to is some of the stuff I was saying uh, about some of the the difficulties in making that happen uh, are much more on the socio side rather than the technical side. Because technically we can do this, we can already do it actually. Uh, but we might need to address some of those uh, soft standards and frameworks. You know, ad addressing an ethics framework, commercial framework, legal frameworks, regulatory frameworks, which are all human things, which actually unlock those kind of other connections, but will also unlock a lot more value. So I think I think we kind of need to expand our, our view of, of not only digital twins, but connected digital twins. Perfect. Thank you. We are running out of time, but we've got one last question, which is actually a really important one. Actually, Mark, you just touched upon it, and we haven't probably talked about it enough, is the role of value chains or SMEs in creating digital twins. Um, can we bring uh, Ben Clegg live um, for the last question, which I believe is um, uh, to do with that? Ben, over to you. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Ben. Great, yes, um, my question's partly be been answered already. Um, I'm working on the ground with uh, an SME company in the automotive uh, supply chain. And um, I think we've heard some fantastic ideas from large companies with great resources and knowledge and deep pockets. But these things are only going to work if those larger companies open up some of this knowledge and experience with their small small suppliers in the supply chain. So I just wondered what those large companies are doing to encourage this type of development in SMEs, uh, what the government is doing. Um, so that's my question, really. It's only going to work if we uh, bring in all of these smaller companies from uh, from. from first and second third tier supply chain okay thanks uh, it's, it's a good question um louise um, i'm wondering again you, you've been at this a while uh, with yours how how have you engaged your sort of broader value chain in what you're doing how, have you have you nurtured them to, to to provide you with the information that you need to to be successful for the energy twin um so far it's been a very internal um 2bt activity um, some of the stuff we're looking at going forward is how to integrate because our carbon footprint um, is dominated by our supply chain. Um, going forward, I think we're going to need to work much more closely with the supply chain. Um, what scares me there is how rapidly that problem can explode. Um, there are so many different suppliers um, to BT out there. And it's like, I don't really know where to start, to be honest. <laughs> Okay, and, and that, I like I love the honesty because I, I think because I think it's a massive ch challenge. Jose, sim similarly for you, you do have a massive value chain. Um, have you have you started to think about how you're going to engage them? Because again, they're going to be critical to your success in delivering digital twins. How are you engaging your value chains? It's it's a it's a really really good question. Um, you might not like the answer here but we are becoming more forceful with the supply chain regarding them having the necessary tools in order to collaborate with us. Now, it is a problem for the small suppliers and we are becoming increasingly forceful about this to the point where we are now in cases uh, limiting the supply chain to those companies that can interact with our system and can provide digital models so we do this with companies that are in charge of the assembly lines. We are increasingly expecting them to give to us their models of the robots or the assembly lines that we can plan accordingly. The approach that we have taken is, is, is quite forceful. 
is if you continue to work with us, uh, we expect you to have that, uh, that technology available to you. It is becoming increasingly problematic for the small suppliers because the technology required is not cheap. Um, and this is probably where the Institute uh, of Digital Engineering uh, can really help in terms of lowering the barrier to entry to a small to a small companies because OEMs like us are increasingly being more demanding and more, more forceful. And, and, and there is an increasing competition in the supply chain uh, and a differentiator is the ability to work with us in the area of digital twin. That, that, uh, no, again, I love the honesty, and I, 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 I do get it as well. As, as a large corporate, your, if your survival is dependent upon developing the, these, these future digital twins okay. and, and digitalization, you can't, you can't always be nice. Um, you sometimes need to choose those players who are most likely to allow you to deliver your corporate objectives. But yeah. I, I don't want to end the conference purely on that note. I think there is a lot of help out there. Uh, Mark's talked about DT Hub um, and CDBB. I, I think there's some excellent work going on across the, the UK. We're trying, as Institute of Digital Engineering, we've published a roadmap. I think we've got a clearer picture of the capabilities that we need to be developing. Um, I think there is help. There's help within the, the, within the Catapult Network as well, uh, where they're starting to explore this. So don't feel that you're, you're alone. Definitely reach out to us, reach out to... To, to mark as well after this in help. I think, you know, it, it is critical though, uh, to, to, to Jose's point, that if, if smaller SMEs want to remain relevant and competitive, then they are going to have to accept, they're going to have to change. Um, I, I think digitalization is, is not a foregone conclusion, but it probably is for those that want to exist in the next 10 years, um, to, 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 to Peter's point of view. I think where we need to work together is, is on what Mark is doing is around, a lot of it is around interoperability and standards and a common language is gonna be key to survival. And, but also I think we all need to work together to try and drive more intervention from government in terms of funding some of these activities to ensure that we can drive this level of change um, across not just our, our, our national OEMs, but, but around creating a value chain or supply chain within the UK that is globally competitive um, and appealing. And I, I think that's the challenge that's ahead of us. I think we're pretty much out of time, um, but I'd like to thank very much the panelists for their excellent insights. I'm sorry we didn't come to you all with as many questions as we were as hoping, um, but some great chat that we'll, we'll make sure we're publicized well. Big thanks to Mark as well um, for all his um, insight and help and support in getting the messages out there. Um, just to remind you, this is the first in a series of events. There's another event on the 28th of September, with again, a similarly provocative title, Are Sustainable Batteries a Unicorn? Uh, so by all means, subscribe to that. Um, but for now, I'd like to thank my team um, and, the, and the hidden talent behind me that makes this all magically work, but especially a big thanks to the panelists and the audience and hope to see you again soon. Thank you.